How many times have you been in a conversation with people? Maybe you've been witnessing to them and they just kind of look at you like, why would I ever want to consider being saved? Uh, they clearly don't understand their own state, their own situation. Um, so before we give them John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Before we do that, we need to make sure that they understand um, the relevance of that. And so, uh, and, it, and what I'm going to talk about today is the sort of prequel to the good news. And I'm going to give you both the legal side from God's perspective, and I'm going to give you the functional or existential side of that. Um, Malcolm Muggeridge uh, once said this, he said, the depravity of man is at once the most empirically verifiable reality, but at the same time, most intellectually resisted fact. It's a fact. And so I'd like to take you uh, through that. And I'd like to start with the scripture in Ephesians, Ephesians 2 verses 1 to 5. <clears throat> And I'll read that. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air. Now, of course, he's talking to people who are looking back before they came to the Lord, before they became believers and what they were following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. In other words, the world. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature, in other words, born into being children of wrath. You're either God's son, you accepted him as your Lord, your savior, or you are children of the prince of the power of the air. So it continues, and we're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. This is pretty harsh, but it's the reality. But God, and now here comes the good news, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace, you have been saved. Now I'd like to start with the legal side of this and give you just a few scriptures uh, from God's perspective of the legal side the fact that sin, sinfulness, alienates us from God. In Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3, talks about Adam and Eve's sin that separated us, uh, them from God. They could no longer bear to be in his presence in the Garden of Eden, but sought to avoid him. They ran from him. In Isaiah 59, it talks about our sins and our iniquities separate us from God so he will not hear us. So you get that separation uh, part in there. And in Ephesians chapter 2, again, he talks about people in sin are separated from Christ without God in the world. Now, how can we talk to God? How can we relate to him? How can we even relate to his creation if we are separate uh, from God. So that was the legal side. We are separate from God. And God, of course, we know in the good news, bridged that and he gave us a way to be near him and to be with him. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the functional side. I'm going to talk most in this message about the functional or existential uh, side of this. Uh, and the relevance 
of life today. Um, now here's some scriptures. Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? All right, so this is talking about our heart, about our motivation. Genesis 6, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and, every, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Of course, this was before um, he flooded the world. Romans chapter 7, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right. I, I hear things and I want to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out because there's something within me that just continues to uh, lean me towards evil. Romans 3, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now there's uh, a few other scriptures that I'll um, give you uh, later on, but you see that this is talking about our heart. It's not talking about doing sin once in a while or doing evil once in a while. It's talking about our intentions, our motivation in this life that we are born by nature, children of wrath, we are born by nature not to want to follow God. All right, so um, uh, there are implications of this alienation from God. Uh, I think this is very relevant. Uh, when I say relevant, something I can see, hear, taste, touch, smell, something that I live in today and it's called existential, uh, meaning uh, it's not just somebody telling me I need to be saved. There's something going on. When I look across at the world and I see, and particularly in these days, uh, we are looking at politicians, for example, right now, and we see them say one thing and do another, or we see them doing things that make no sense uh, if they're good people. Uh, and I'm not saying all politicians are good or bad, that's just show, they show us an example, especially in these days. And uh, it can be very confusing to people unless you understand what I'm talking about uh, today. So uh, I wanted to introduce you to a doctrine of depravity. Now, some people call it radical corruption of the heart of people. The word radical divide derives from the Latin radix or radix which means root to say that mankind is radically corrupt is to say that sin penetrates to the root or to the core of our being sin is not a peripheral thing but it arises from the center of our being it flows from what the bible calls the heart so it uses uh, that word heart to refer to the center of our being it doesn't refer to the muscle that pumps blood throughout our bodies, but to the core of our being. Uh, even the word uh, core derives from the Latin word from heart. So Jesus frequently described this condition with images from nature. Uh, just as the corrupt tree yields corrupt fruit, as he had said, uh, so sin flows out of a corrupt human nature. We, we don't do a lot of corrupt things because we're good. We do them because we're corrupt. There's something inside us that's corrupt. Listen to this one, okay? Now remember this little phrase, and I, I'm not sure who quoted it, but it stuck with me. We are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. Since the fall, human nature has been corrupt. We are born with a sin nature. Our acts of sin flow out of a corrupt nature. Uh, I think about the babies. Uh, a little baby does most of the time. It cries. What does it do that for? It tries to interrupt you so that you will do something for it. It wants something, and therefore it cries. Now, for a little baby, we, we never say it's bad for a baby to cry. 
and that's not my point. My point is that even as we grow as little children and, and, uh, and grow into adulthood, the fact is that we always lean to doing something not good, something that the parents really didn't want us to do. And, uh, and so the Apostle Paul cited in the Old Testament, Testament uh, and it summarizes this universal condition of sin. Uh, in Romans chapter 3, and by the way, if you uh, look at Romans chapter 1 uh, from verses 18 on, you will see a much more uh, a challenging uh, wording on what I'm saying there. And I just chose Ephesians because I, it was shorter and it still made sense uh, with this message. But he says in Romans 3, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. There is none. Uh, they have all gone out of the way. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Now that's continued on in Psalms 14 and 53, Ecclesiastes 7 throughout the Bible. Here the apostle speaks of our being under sin. We use figurative language with respect to human beings. We say a diligent person is on top of his work, which means he has control over it. Um, conversely, to be under things is to be under that control or their control. When Paul speaks of our being under sin, he's using the same sort of language. Uh, to be under sin is to be controlled by our sin nature. Sin is a weight or a burden that presses downward on our very soul. And so these are things we need to understand. So uh, the theologians acknowledge that sinners in their fallen condition are still capable of performing what was called uh, uh, works of civil virtue. Civil virtue re re refers to deeds that conform outwardly to the law. In other words, people think, oh, he's doing good. He's doing what God wants. Fallen sinners can refrain from stealing or performing acts of charity, uh, uh, but these deeds are not deemed good in an ultimate sense by God. When God evaluates the actions of people, he considers not only the outward deeds in and of themselves, but also, and more importantly, the motives behind these acts. <clears throat> <clears throat> the supreme motive required of everyone, everything we do as a Christian is the love of God. That drives the Christian in everything they do. Now, it doesn't mean they always do that because the sin nature is still fighting. A deed that outwardly conforms to God's law but proceeds from a heart that's alienated from God is not deemed by God a good deed. The whole action, including the inclination of the doer's heart, is brought under the scrutiny of God and found wanting. There was a certain French diplomat who wrote a lot about uh, democracy in America and, and he had a lot of good things to say. He said that civic virtue is motivated by enlightened self-interest. A lot of clubs and things that do good things but are not doing it out of love of Christ are doing it because of an enlightened self-interest. Such outwardly virtuous acts are not motivated by desire to please or honor God, but by a desire to protect, quote, our own interests. We may learn, for example, that there are circumstances where crime does not pay. We may obey legal speed limits to avoid a spe speeding ticket. We are restrained from sinning to our full potential by law, culture, and the prospect of conflict with other sinful people. On the positive side, we might even do virtuous deeds, but we are motivated by a desire for the applause of others. Here the opposite assumption that certain virtues actually pay in the world plays a role. Absent in both cases 
is the motive of a heartfelt love for God. Augustine, who, who lived in the fourth century uh, AD, argued that grace not only facilitates our efforts, this is grace of God, facilitates our efforts to obey God, but because of our fallen nature, grace is necessary. Now grace, as you read in Ephesians, we're saved by grace. God does something. He acts towards us. He opens up our hearts. He, he opens up that sin nature that otherwise we could not do anything by the love of God. We could not even love God. We don't want to love God. That's the way we're built as we um, were born. But grace comes into play. And that's very important to know. Before the fall, the requirement for moral perfection was already present. The fall did not change the requirement, but it did change us. What was once a moral possibility became, without grace, a moral impossibility. Augustine's view is rooted in the doctrine of original sin, which you've probably heard of. You're saying, well, why does that, why do what Adam do, why does that affect me? I'm not Adam. Well, in effect, you are. You were born in the race that Adam was, and since Adam, we've been born into that sinful nature. David said that clearly in Psalms. Now, denying original sin, some argue that human nature, we were all created good. We just have to continue to get better. They say sin does not change our essential moral nature. We may sin, but we remain basically good people. I've seen that on, on uh, films, movies, and so forth. But we're, we're, we're good. But it does not prove out. If you remember uh, that quote I made right at the beginning, that uh, the fact that we see, we can look around and we can see constantly people leaning towards evil. That comes from the human nature and that's something existential, something we could see, we could feel, touch, smell, taste. It's there. The idea of mankind's basic goodness is a core tenet of humanistic philosophy, which is very prevalent today. Uh, it even gets into American evangelicism. If recent polls are all correct, in a Gallup poll, the overwhelming majority of professional evangelicals indicated their agreement with the proposition that people are basically good. So if we have pastors believing that, then why would people want to get saved? What are they doing in the church if they believe that? Augustine, on the other hand, argued that sin is universal and that mankind, he called mankind a mass of sin because of our hearts. So I'm talking about the functional side here of this separation that we have from God. Man is incapable of elevating himself to the good without the work of God's grace within him. We can no more return ourselves to God than an empty vessel can refill itself with water. Before the fall, Adam had the ability to sin and the ability not to sin. He did not possess the inability to sin or the inability not to sin. So I'll show it here uh, on your screen. Now we struggle a bit with this language because of the last condition, which describes Augustine's view of original sin. It's spelled out with a double negative. To say that fallen man is unable not to sin means that we are able only to sin. Now it's getting back to the scriptures that I've given you, that man sins. Man is full of sin. Man has a sinful nature. We, are, we simply are unable to live without sinning because our heart is full of sin, because our heart has a nature of Adam. We sin out of a kind of moral necessity because we act according 
to that fallen nature within us. We do corrupt things because we are corrupt people. Now, that sounds very negative. That's why there's good news. This is the essence of what it means to be fallen. The resulting reality uh, of falling is, is guilt. Luther had Romans in mind when he made this statement. Romans 3, 11, Paul declares, there is none who seeks after God. On the surface, this is a startling judgment. The Bible frequently admonishes people to seek after God, yet it, it also teaches that in our fallen state, none of us, in fact, does seek after God. The basics here of a unregenerate man, a lost man, is that of a fugitive. So you picture a lost person as a fugitive. Our natural inclination is to flee from God. The first uh, sin in Eden provoked the first flight from his presence, a flight to hide from God and the scrutiny of him. The sensation of nakedness was linked to the first awareness of guilt. Adam and Eve sought a covering for their shame, a hiding place from their guilt. This was the first episode of human cover-up. You could call it an Eden gate. Now, if you've talked to psychologists, people who've counseled people, they will tell you that the number one problem that people come in with is guilt. Now, we frequently hear evangelical Christians say that non-Christians friends are seeking God or seeking, searching for God, okay? Uh, why do we say this when scripture so clearly teaches that no unregenerate person seeks after God? Well, Thomas Aquinas observed that people uh, are seeking happiness, peace, relief from guilt, personal fulfillment, and other benefits. In his classic work, on the freedom of the will, and I have the book, Jonathan Edwards defined the will as, quote, mind choosing. Edwards did not deny that there was a meaningful distinction between the mind and the will. They are distinct faculties, although the mind and the will may be distinguished from one another, they may not be separated from each other. When we talk about in the scriptures, the mind and the will. Moral actions involve rational choices. A mindless choice, which we might say, well, we're not taking them from any motive. We are just, it's, it's mindless. It is uh, neutral. Plants may incline their root towards water by a series of physical causes, but we do not judge this moment or this movement in terms of virtue or vice. These actions are involuntary. We also participate in involuntary actions. We do not decide to have our hearts pump blood through our circulatory system. This is involuntary. The brain may be involved in this process from a physiological vantage point, but not from the vantage point of a conscious decision. When Edwards spoke of the will as, quote, mind choosing, he meant that we make choices according to what we deem preferable in terms of the options before us. Edwards says that we always choose according to the inclination that is strongest at the moment. You've probably heard that before. This is a crucial insight into our will. It means that every choice we make has an antecedent cause. Our choices are not spontaneous, arising out of nothing. They're not neutral. There is a reason for every choice we make. In a narrow sense, every choice we make is determined. But to say that our choices are determined sounds very much like determinism. We're not talking about that here. Determinism means that our choices are controlled by external forces. This result is some form of coercion, uh, which cancels out our free choice. What Edwards had in mind is something different. Our choices are determined in the sense 
that they have a cause. This cause is the inclination of the will. This is self-determination, which is the very essence of free will. If I determined what I choose, this is not determinism, but it's a kind of determinism. When we feel strongly about doing something, we may exclaim, I am determined to do this. This refers to a strong desire, inclination of the will to move in a certain direction. When Edwards says that we always choose according to our strongest inclination at the moment, he means not only that we may choose what we most want at the moment, but that we must choose it. So this is exactly how we make choices. Try to think of a choice you made that was not in accord with your strongest inclination at the time that you made that. Okay. An example might be, and I always laugh at the uh, Jack Benny skit. Benny was confronted by a robber who said to him, your money or your life. Benny stood there mute with a, a, a thoughtful look on his face. Growing impatient, the robber said, well, which is it, your money or your life? And Benny said, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. I always thought that was funny. But this story emphasizes that things are not always equal when we make choices. The robber reduces this victim's option to two, money or life. All things being equal, the victim has no desire to donate his money to any robber. But once death is threatened, however, the desire levels change. The victim has a greater desire to continue living than to keep his wallet. So he hands over his money. There is certainly a, a, an element of coercion in the scenario, but the coercion is not absolute. It is extreme but not final. The choice is still there to pay or to die. A person may have such strong feelings against robbery that he prefers to die. He may cry, give me liberty or give me death. But he knows that even if he dies as a martyr to his cause, the robber will still take his money. The point of the illustration is that we must choose according to our strongest inclination at the moment. We must understand this as we seek to grow in our obedience to God. You see, the more we know God, the more we hear from him, the more scriptures we read and, and this um, strength of the Lord within us, the more our inclination is not going to just switch over to something else that's perhaps carnal. Every time I sin, I do so because at the moment, I prefer the sin to obedience. That's interesting. I may have a real desire in my heart to be obedient, but this desire runs into conflict with my sinful desires. This is the dilemma expressed by the Apostle Paul. You remember uh, in Romans chapter 7, I'll show it. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not do, I agree with the law that, that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. You see, he's uh, saying that again in another way. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, I practice. We all find that. Maybe addictions or something that we know is wrong. And we say to ourselves at one point when we're strong, I'm not going to do it. But then when that addiction comes, maybe a feeling comes over you or, or, or you feel the need or something, that's when... Well, we make the decision once again to do what we know we don't want to do. The struggle between spirit and the flesh is a struggle of a regenerate person, a saved person. 
a person that has the Holy Spirit inside to help him. That's when the struggle occurs. You see, when we don't have the Holy Spirit, it's, it's easy. We just do what the flesh tells us to do. The unregenerate natural man, as the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians, has no such struggle. He is in bondage to sin, acting according to the flesh, living according to the flesh, and choosing according to the flesh. He chooses according to the inclination that is strongest at the moment. And this inclination is never a desire to honor God out of a natural love for him. A man rejects God neither because of intellectual demands or a lack of evidence. People will say, you're witnessing. I'll say, well, I just don't have enough evidence. Or intellectually, I just can't put it together. And a man rejects God because of a moral resistance, his nature that refuses to admit his need for God. And that's why we think about, we tell people, we say, if you uh, have this inclination towards God, if, if uh, a, a person that's lost, if you feel God speaking to you, that's his grace. You better obey it. Because we've also seen in the Bible, when you say no, 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 as God tries to move you, at some point, he's not going to move you anymore. He did that with Pharaoh. Another word for regeneration. So we're getting towards the good news now. Another word for regeneration is rebirth. Relating to the biblical phrase, born again. Jesus talked with Nicodemus. Our rebirth is distinguished from our first birth when we were conceived physically and inherited our sin nature. The first man is Adam, the last man is Christ. The new birth is a spiritual, holy, and heavenly birth that results in our being made alive spiritually. Man in his natural state is dead in his trespasses and his sins until he is made alive or regenerated by Christ. This happens when he places his faith in Christ in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins is what it says. The Holy Spirit, for those who come to, Lord, to the Lord, lives in us, the third person of the Trinity. And therefore, then, we have the cap capability to not sin and to do good created by the love of God. We know the message to sinners, to the unregenerate, by both John the Baptist and by Christ were to repent and be saved. Turn from you as being Lord to God as being Lord or Christ. And he will do the rest. He will save you and you will be reborn. Thank you and may God bless you.